Episode 9 of House of the Dragon had everything that we'd expected from it and so much more. The Green Council gave us all the political intrigue that we could have expected from a treasonous small council meeting. And then some. Aemon's kingly ambitions, Aegon's cruel self-awareness, Helena's continued terror of the beast beneath the boards, and everything that Alicent and Otto did to each other. Oh, and of course, Princess Rhaenys getting her moment in the sun. The queen who never was. But in amongst all this madness, you might have missed out on the fact that the war is already afoot. Not the Dance of the Dragons, but the Battle of the Spy Masters. Lady Misery and Lord Clubfoot have both made their first moves in a bid to secure King's Landing. But the question that's all on our minds is, who is going to come out on top? Well, let's investigate, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, then please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. It's been quite a night at the castle, Sims. Yes, please. The White Worm of the Streets, Lady Miseria, and the House of the Dragon. Let's go about this video chronologically in terms of order of appearance, and then we'll give you an evaluation of where they both stand and how they both will proceed from there. The Lady Miseria is far more established in the capital city than her club-footed rival, and that counts for a lot of things. In Fire and Blood, Miseria is a Lysene dancing girl who becomes Prince Daemon Targaryen's paramour. When the prince is exiled from the capital by his brother, she goes with him to Dragonstone and becomes pregnant with Daemon's child. When the rogue prince tries to give her a dragon's egg, keeping in line with ancient Targaryen customs, he is stopped by the king, who commands him to return the egg, banish his whore, and return to his lawful wife in Runestone. Daemon begrudgingly abides by his brother's commands and puts his lover and his unborn child on a ship bound for Lys. But Missaria miscarries the babe on board, and this steals the rogue prince's heart against his brother. The next time we hear of her would be over two decades later, when a man called Blood speaks of a pale woman who acted as his go-between for committing an unspeakable crime against the royal family. Turns out, instead of going back home, Missaria had returned to King's Landing and decided to become a spy master, who was both respected and feared in the city. After spending at least a year from the capital including her flight with Damon, and everything that had followed, no one seemed to quite remember her. The harlots who had been her companions before now only called her misery, and this worm's reach went everywhere. From Flea Bottom to the Red Keep itself, it is this influence that House of the Dragon has decided to establish rather early on in the series, as Missaria has constantly been lurking in the shadows of the royal family. She was introduced as Prince Damon's paramour and closest confidant in the first episode of the series, but has since become something else entirely. House of the Dragon kept her and Damon together for all two episodes. Missaria's pregnancy turns out to be a farce in the TV show, one of Damon's creation, and this, coupled with the fact that the rogue prince lied about them getting married, makes her realize that she is but a pawn in his games. Missaria chastises Damon for using her as her previous owners and slave masters had and tells him she came to him to be liberated from fear, not to delve deeper into its jaws. She leaves him to his games with the king and removes herself from Dragonstone, resurfacing in King's Landing where she has been hard at work trying to become a player herself. Somewhere along the line, Missaria figured out what Varys did years later. That information is where the true power and wealth lies, and so she becomes an information broker in King's Landing, going by the alias of the White Worm, and using kids as her in-betweens. The first time we see her in action as a spymaster is when she informs on Daemon her former lover, to Otto Hightower. It's clear that Missaria no longer holds that kind of affection for him. Her greeting to him is rather cold the morning after when he wakes up all hungover. But she does still care for him because she was considerate enough to keep him in a private room for the night. All that might have evaporated when Damon calls her a common whore and refuses to take her help. But what remains solid is Missaria's network of little worms. Over the next decade and a half, she expands her reach to the Red Keep, and has extended her team to including women and children, some of whom work for the royal family, like Talia, Alicent's lady-in-waiting, who tells Missaria about the king's sad medical state and the whispers from his last supper, or Jane, the common woman who brings Sir Eric and Sir Eric an offer from the elusive white worm. She would give Otto his prince back if he acquiesced to her demands. For you see, Missaria was the first person to know of King Viserys' death, 
and she did not waste a single second ensuring that she held the reins of the succession in her hands. She secured Prince Aegon and stashed him in the Grand Sept at King's Landing before treating with Otto. She would have the rat pits closed and a sizable amount of gold in exchange for the future king of the realm. You can see how far Missaria has climbed in terms of political power because she is now able to threaten Otto Hightower, a man whom she was informing for a decade ago. And that should also tell you how smart she is inherently. She has been keeping her identity secret for so many years that Otto doesn't even know she used to be Damon's paramour. It's not like the rogue prince was hiding his activities from the world nor were his favorite hidden from sight. So that is Missaria at this point in the story, a powerful, influential broker of information and proprietor of flesh whose spy network will give a certain bloody raven a run for his money decades later. And this is after Lord Brynden manifests both his Valerian and Old God's magic. You can say nothing happens in King's Landing without her knowing, and you would be correct. She has moved her people into so many places of importance in the city that finding out their true number is next to impossible. The White Worm is already a shining example for future masters and mistresses of Whisperers, but then there is her rival to consider, the man who will become the actual master of Whisperers in the House of the Dragon. The Club-Footed Beast of the Red Keep, Lord Varys Strong in House of the Dragon. Larys Strong entered House of the Dragon as the unassuming second son of the Master of Laws, Lionel Strong, but quickly made it known that he had greater ambitions. Ambitions so great, in fact, that he was willing to sacrifice his own father and brother to realize them. In Fire and Blood, the Clubfoot is not given nearly as much of a close look as we have received in the TV show and that further solidifies his status as a social enigma. Laris came to King's Landing in 105 AC with his father and his brother Harwin, and joined King Viserys' Order of Confessors, aka the Royal Torturers. Using his skill as a Master Confessor and Interrogator, he rose to the post of Lord Confessor and over time became the Master of Whisperers under Otto Hightower's second residence as Hand of the King. His involvement in the burning of Harrenhal is suspect at best, and his true worth as a spy master comes into fruition with the Dance of the Dragons. It's because of Larry Strong that King Aegon and his children managed to escape the Red Keep before the Green Cause was lost, and it is because of Laris that the king even survives the war in the first place. The Clubfoot knows the passageways of the Red Keep and the sentiments of the King's Landers, and so he spends most of Rhaenyra's occupancy plotting her downfall with the commoners of the capital. During the Moon of the Three Kings, it is Lord Laris who runs King's Landing in all but name, and it is thanks to him that King Aegon returns to his father's seat safely from his flight. Laris Strong's loyalty to either cause is questioned till this day in the Citadel, for after reinstalling Aegon to the throne, he was also involved in his downfall. But we do not get anywhere close to figuring out who he truly worked for. All accounts seem to suggest that the Clubfoot was only loyal to himself, and that is what House of the Dragon is showing us as well. The first time we see him is when Rhaenyra is roaming about her father's royal hunting tent and acquainting herself with the women of his court. Laris simply introduces himself as a cripple who has no other place but with the ladies, and so he takes his seat amongst them, but if you pay close attention to him, he's deciding which side he should be picking. Because Larry Strong's status as a clubfoot makes him obscure at noble gatherings, he has learned how to observe instead and his vision is as keen as his thirst for power. He quickly picks up on the fact that the princess and the queen have a clear rift between them and gets to work on fueling the flames with gasoline. In episode 5 after Rhaenyra has decided to take Kristen Cole into her bed, Laris decides that he will strengthen his own hand by showing his loyalty to her direct rival. Under the guise of inspecting exotic flowers in the Red Keep's Godswood, Laris approaches Queen Alicent, whom he knew he would find there at that hour, and starts planting the seeds of doubt into her mind. He inquires about Rhaenyra's health as a subtle means of letting Alicent know that her childhood companion had in fact had moon tea, which could only mean one thing. She lied about losing her maiden head to Damon. Well, half a lie, she did lose her maiden head, but it was to Kristen Cole, not Damon Targaryen. And the King's Guard Knight fesses up almost immediately when he is summoned by the Queen after her conversation with Laris, 
so his schemes have already worked their magic. As for now, he found out that Melos was heading to Rhaenyra with Moonti. Well, it's possible that he had already begun spreading informers throughout the Red Keep. Guards, handmaidens, serving children, any of them could be on his payroll. And then there is the belief that Lord Laris is a green seer. If that is true, then we need speak no further of how exactly he got such sensitive information. But after proving his usefulness to the Queen, Laris becomes her closest confidant and spends the next decade and a half proving his loyalty to Allison. He mutilates inmates of the Black Cells, puts them under his own employment, gives them golden flea brooches and sends them to kill his own father and brother to amend the king's willful blindness and give his queen the friend at court she so desperately desires. He spends the rest of his time gawking at Alicent without shame and even propositions to help her once again, but the queen simply tells him that she will call on him when she needs his discretion. The next time she decides to use Laris' skills, it is clear that she has lost a lot of ground to him because their relationship has turned sexual. Alicent allows Laris to slake his foot fetish with her own feet as he gives her information that can put her ahead of her father and everyone else in the Game of Thrones. It is here that we realize just how far his own reach goes within King's Land. Earlier in the episode, Laris apprehended Lord Alan Caswell as he was trying to escape the capital and alert Rhaenyra of the High Tower's usury. Otto High Tower called the Lord Confessor's efforts admirable and remarked that he had been spending more and more time in his own daughter's presence. To which Laris replied that there was no reason that his time with the Queen could not, in the end, benefit the hand. And before, when all the workers of the Red Keep were being rounded up by the High Towers to prevent them from speaking with anyone that might alert Rhaenyra to Viserys' passing, Laris accurately deduces that Talia is one of the White Worm spies. He not only plays father against daughter, he also takes advantage of the daughter's vulnerability for his own sexual pleasures and drives the wedge further into their relationship just by existing and being indispensable. He's like a far more sadistic and perverted version of Lord Varys from the main series, and that perception only increases once you realize what the Lord of Harrenhal has done to protect his queen from the spiders within the Red Keep. One of the little spiders is your lady in waiting. Laris the Clubfoot versus Misery the White Worm. Who will emerge victorious? The first shot in the Battle of the Spy Masters has already been shot, and you might have missed it if you weren't paying close attention. After Laris gets Allison's permission to deal with the network of spies within the Red Keep, he decides to use his beloved murder tactic once again and take it out at the head. In Episode 8 of House of the Dragon, we saw that Missaria no longer resides in the hovels of the Street of Silk, instead languishing in a lavish manse with three distinct arches crowning its front balcony. Towards the end of Episode 9, we see that same balcony and the entire house within up in flames as a hooded figure paces away from the scene, a golden flea brooch fastening the straps of his cloak. If you guys missed this, then we'll spell out what happened here for you. Laris Strong condemned the White Worm to death by fire. More likely than not, he found out about this location from Talia, whom he could have had sharply questioned after realizing that she was Mysterious agent down in the Black Cells. But if you think for a second that this was enough to take down a woman whose reputation gave her the sobriquet misery, then you're sorely mistaken. Missaria is the same woman who spurned Prince Damon and lived to tell the tale. She has been working in King's Landing for some 15 odd years as an information broker and has so much influence in the city that she can kidnap the future king like he were yet another flea bottom child. Otto Hightower has known of her from his days as Viserys' hand the first time around and yet he only sees her face after Viserys dies, and even then he is unaware of Viserys' entire story. A simple house fire is not enough to take out Lady Misery, and she will resurface and have her revenge on the clubfoot. The battle between the spy masters will be an intense one because both Laris and Missaria will be integral to the war effort for their respective lieges. Missaria now has motivation to hate the High Tower administration because she is not going to put down an attack on her life right after she demanded that the Hand of the King stop the use of children in Flea Bottom's rat pits, to mere coincidence. She will not be willing to discuss the minutia of the attack and who actually ordered it and who did it. She warned Otto that she better remember she could have killed his grandson and ended the rebellion in a single night, and she is going to take this as retaliation for her boldness. 
Despite hating Damon's guts and treatment of her, Miseria will now be more than willing to ally herself with her former lover, and even rekindle their relationship if Fire and Blood is to be believed. She will be the person who will hire the beast beneath the boards that has been scouring Queen Helena for the past two episodes. Laris will be forced to play a defensive game for the rest of the dance and he will be unable to take any action of real consequence, devoid of his king and his seat on the small council. Though he enjoys Allison's trust and is well established in the Red Keep at this moment, he will soon be forced to abdicate and that will take away most of his direct political power. He will instead take to guerrilla warfare and use whispers to poison the capital against Rhaenyra and make a power grab at the very end which will end up being successful enough to make the Black Queen flee the capital. If you were paying attention to what we said about Laris's accomplishments in Fire and Blood, then you already know the answer to the question this video poses. But in the spirit of not spoiling House of the Dragon for our casual viewers, we will say this. While both spy masters are condemned to die, a clear winner will emerge as the later stages of the dance unfold. One of these two spiders are going to have the other at their mercy, and be the direct cause of their death as well, and trust us when we say this particular scene will have nothing on the walk of shame you guys witnessed in Season 5 of Game of Thrones. The White Worm vs. the Firefly will have a clear winner in the end, but the losers will be the Targaryen family, the royal court, and the Seven Kingdoms beyond King's Landing's walls. For it will be their Machiavellian machinations that will ensure that the Dance of the Dragons does not see a peaceful outcome, no matter how many times both sides even consider the possibility. So maybe the real question should be, who wins when the spiders dance? Because all that Miseria and Larry Strong are about to unleash on the realm is chaos. And while it might be a ladder for them, the cost of climbing it is going to be counted with tens of thousands of corpses. Where's the prince? He is safely tucked away. Marvelous verdict. Larry Strong versus Lady Miseria is yet another Game of Thrones wrong that House of the Dragons can make right. Though the dialogue work between Conlet Hales Varys and Aidan Gillens Baelish was exceptional, their rivalry was abruptly dropped after the D's, who shall not be named, ran out of George's material to pull from. The result was a disjointed and frankly punk death for two spy masters who seemed destined to kill one another. Well, we're just glad that George R. R. Martin is a history repeats itself kind of guy and excited beyond measure to witness the first chronological Spymaster vs. Spymaster battle play out in the Game of Thrones franchise. If nothing else, it has already proven to have an appetite for both fire and blood, and that's all we really need. If you like the content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone! Yeah.